Graduated Realization An Original Short Story by Jared I. McGee Doubt thou the stars are fire? Doubt thou the sun doth move? Doubt truth be a liar? But never doubt I love. Hamlet Act 2 Scene 2 Line 115 It is always difficult seeing the magnitude of a moment in that moment. For example, birthdays sometimes seem life-affirming or soul-crushing to the birthday boy or girl, no matter what their age, when, in reality, they are often just another day with a bit of guilt around it, in the form of a cake, or a little bit of extra attention from friends and family. Whereas, the decision to go to Chinese over Italian might not feel like a shift in the universe, yet this is the type of mundane decision that can, will, and does cause one to garner a smile in that restaurant. The smile back might not seem like a magnitudinous moment, but that smile then opens up the door for them to meet their new fling, who becomes their reluctant partner, who becomes their devoted spouse, who becomes their bitter divorce. All over a trade of lasagna for lo mein. So as I sat there in the Colosseum in my amorphous crimson robe, I couldn't help but wonder if this inane ritual we like to throw for graduations was more the big build-up to an even bigger letdown, or the hollow ceremony that actually does defy cynicism and actually means something. Rather quickly upon entering and sitting down, I saw that being placed in the MAs was going to be a little awkward for me. My name... Tony Martin, put me there, of course, but it was only in the moment of actually sitting amidst my peers from Rhodesville High School that I realized that I had not exactly run with the MA crew throughout my four years in this school system. All of my dearest friends were rows and rows away from me, out of eye and earshot, by far. Directly to my right was a gentleman that had accosted friends of mine relentlessly in our younger years, only to become a bit of a pariah in his own right, as adolescence rapidly shaped and reshaped who we were and our entire social hierarchy. Ronald McCard. In French, supposedly, it was Ronald Macquart. Directly to my left was one of the most gorgeous girls I'd known in my entire life. I could not know it at the time, but she wasn't as snobby as we all thought she was. Yes, she was a drill team captain, co-head cheerleader, top chair flute, and had a face, body, look, magic about her that would make any Hollywood bombshell jealous. But it would turn out much later that she was actually quite shy and self-deprecating. All I knew was that preppy little Miss Won't Talk to Me Tasha Mason was sitting right by me. There on my little M.A. island, far away from my friends, I tried to make begrudging small talk with these two people with whom, at least on the surface, I had absolutely nothing in common with. I realized rather quickly that, even if I were being generous, I absolutely could not say that we had no real shared experiences from which to draw, no shared close acquaintances from whom we could derive some sort of tenuous connection for what would become the four hours of graduation rehearsal it took to practice this hallowed rite of passage with around a thousand teenagers. I asked Ronald about his twin sister that had once gone to school with us, but who had moved away. Apparently, Mandy had gotten pregnant, dropped out, and married the 26-year-old guy that was the father all with their parents' blessing. 
Not exactly the best answer to get a conversation up and moving, eh? I asked Tasha if she knew her plans for after graduation. With an ear-to-ear but utterly disinterested, I'm just doing this because I'm a sweet southern belle and can't simply ignore you smile, she let me know that she would first be going to the Azores, then Majorca, then Ibiza, with her two older siblings on just the smallest of vacations, before her full family vacation, and then heading off to study at Ole Miss. Right. Even after four years, it was easy for me to forget just how wealthy a great many in this sleepy Arkansan town really were. Railroad money, cattle money, oil money, hydroelectric money, nuclear plant money, just plain money. I smiled back at Tasha and said, Oh, how wonderful! Trying my best to feign both interest and a lack of envy that certainly was inauthentic. Roughly 30 minutes into our stint, I saw one of the crimson gowns we were all wearing hurriedly floating down the main aisle of the row after row of soon-to-be graduates there in the local university's coliseum heading straight for me. Judy Morriston zipped in right behind me, apologizing as she stepped on toes and ruffled noses with her flapping robe. Now, fate was smiling on me. Judy and I had never really been friends, per se, but we had been very friendly acquaintances, and, in our younger years when I was new to Rhodesville, actually there at Rhodesville Junior High, Judy had been so very kind and welcoming to me that I honestly and truly had a warm place in my heart for her then, now, and for always. Judy! I exclaimed, as if she didn't know her own name. I'm so sorry I'm late, Tone. Well, I guess I shouldn't apologize to you, but you know, I'm not normally that girl. She giggled as she widened her enormous emerald eyes amid the fervor of not being that girl. And she wasn't. Judy Morriston, or Morris Town, as some mistakenly pronounced it, was perceived as average in a great many ways by the upper rungs of this little society that was Rhodesville High. But punctuality was not one of the qualities about her that could be filed away in that average folder. Judy was always on time. She'd won some principal's award for never missing and never once being tardy in all her years from middle school to high school. Far from a sexy factoid, but far from an average one as well. We bandied back and forth about how the train that bisects the town had kept her behind schedule in dropping off her little brother at daycare, and how both the red lights, and having to stop to snag her father's dry cleaning, had conspired to that running behind in this horrifying moment for her. I couldn't help but snicker and giggle and twitter along with her as she related her harrowing tale. Judy's joy and massive, genuine, shock white of a smile always was contagious now that I thought about it. I guess I'd never noticed because we'd never gone out of our way to hang out with one another over all these years. When that immediate, in-the-moment topic exhausted itself, I had a brief moment where I thought it would be prudent to turn around and leave the now calmly breathing Miss Morriston alone to concentrate on the proceedings and the overall experience of graduation rehearsal. But, as I began to turn around to the front of the Coliseum, Judy chimed in with a, Hey, Tone, do you remember back in 8th grade when you first moved in here and we were partners in that super sexist life skills class? Remember Mrs. Millstone or Mind Stew or whatever? Mrs. Minifiel? Of course, yeah, I answered, more enthusiastically than I thought myself capable of. Was I really about to fondly reminisce about one of the worst years of my life? See, 8th grade was when I moved to Rhodesville, and I can't say that my peers were all that kind to the new kid. From the football locker room to the cavernous lunchroom, I had things tossed at me constantly, be they parts of burritos, spitwads, or just run-of-the-mill insults. 
One of the very few bright spots in that year, though, was that life skills course. Judy was right. It was a bit sexist in the breakdown of what skills they taught to whom and in what manner. But still, to 13-year-old Tony, it was a place of solace. Not because of the materials we covered. I mean, I was a terrible sewer and cook and checkbook balancer. But because of beaming Judy Morriston, my partner for the year in that course. Yes, indeed. We were assigned partners as if we little 8th graders were married and trying to be real-life adults. Together, we picked out fronds and fabrics for the pillows we sewed. We set tables just so. We learned the names of kitchen implements and how to use them. We learned how to cook several dishes, even going so far as to have another couple over to our set table to a miniature dinner party to demonstrate our poise as hosts. That was actually our midterm. All the tests in that class were joint, in that partners were required to take the tests together. So Judy and I did quite well, her being a sponge for everything but math, and me being pretty good at ensuring our pretend finances were in order, despite my problems with checkbook balancing. I'll never forget the word colander for the rest of my life because of that girl. We scored 100% on one of the most extensive vocabulary tests I'd ever taken, because she remember the name for that bowl with holes, as I lovingly called it. Our partnership was fruitful for that entire year. We had as high an A+, plus as Mrs. Minifiel was allowed to give. It was actually quite shocking to think that our little marriage just dissolved there at the end of 8th grade. I mean, we were extremely close, in retrospect. Thinking back on it, I began to realize just how much fun that class really was. Just how much kindness Judy had shown me all those years ago. Just how bright a spot in a very nasty year that was for me. I thanked her. Hell, I was almost misty-eyed in the moment. She gave that beam of a smile and laughed, ruffling my hair. Hey, if we're not married by the time we're 30, I say we do it for real. We did have the most successful marriage of anyone in the class of 2000. Shit tone. That's probably the healthiest relationship I've had to date. <laughs> I cackled right along with her, ruffled her hair up back, and then shook her hand. It was a deal then. Not married by 30, she'd become Mrs. Judy Martin. Again, I thought our conversation had spin itself out. Life skills was really the last time we had any extended interaction, so I didn't think we'd be able to dig up anything else to keep our little back and forth going. This time, when I went to turn around and face the graduation stage, I did so with a pang of regret. Judy had, in but a few moments time, transformed this painfully boring walkthrough into something, again, the only word for what she had done and who she was was joyous. She'd made this a joyous event by the sheer gravitational pull of her positivity. To my surprise, she stopped me turning around again as she next brought up ninth grade marching band when I had to march with my football gear on, sans my helmet, to earn my grade and be able to continue on into concert band in the winter. At the end of these halftime shows, Judy always made sure to give me a strong smack on my shoulder pads that would tell me to, Go tear him up, Tony! As we continued to reminisce, I abandoned any turning around to face the front, and even scooted my chair a bit to get closer to her, so we could talk in our hushed but excited manner, without being too obnoxious to the MAs and the MOs around us. Smiles and conversation flowed. In all honesty, it was like being parched and finally getting some cool, clean water to assuage that desperate need. Okay, okay, so maybe that's a bit overdramatic, but the interaction was something that I'd longed for and needed, never having known that I'd longed for and needed it. We exhausted my bepadded marching anecdotes and shifted deftly to the next topic, 
and the next, and the next. After ninth grade, we moved up to senior high school. There, I no longer marched at halftime, but I had to give out ice during afternoon practices to earn my grade for the marching portion of band. From 10th grade on then, I sought Judy out to ensure that she got the first fistfuls of ice, as well as as many refills as she could possibly ever want or need, even in the sweltering southern heat. Junior year, my girlfriend from the summer dumped me at our annual back to school dance. As I sat there trying not to get weepy to Journey's open arms, Judy had come to the rescue, seeking me out to slow dance to the song and ensure my next to last of these gatherings wasn't utterly ruined, stamping it with that slow dance and a great many more in a gaggle of her friends after that. I'd forgotten about that dumping because of that. In our final year of high school, we had an ongoing joke that really did not impress either of our significant others. Every day, every single day of our senior year, we'd veer out of our way for me to give Judy a stick or two of winter fresh gum. There was no conversation at these exchanges. There was no formalized meeting prearranged. It just started organically happening, and it just started making us giggle. So, not much of a joke to anyone but Judy and me. Story after story flowed forth reminding me how interwoven Judy and my lives were over these handful of years I'd been going to school with her. What a revelation to my young mind. Judy was never popular. She was not one of the sought-after man-I-wish-I-could-ever-have-a-chance-to-date-her types for the hormone-crazed young men that surrounded her. She was never Tasha Mason hot. But here... Now? I stared at her, and was seeing someone entirely new, but someone that had always been there before me. Seafoam green eyes that gathered all the light in the room and shot it back at whoever was in her gaze tenfold. Deep dimples bookended an enormous gleaming smile that, now that I thought of it, never failed to grace Judy's face. I quite literally could not remember her without it, nor could I begin to imagine her without it. A light dusting of the smallest freckles graced beautiful olive skin that was far from tan and far from alabaster. Her deep brown hair was thick and somewhat unruly, the handful of lighter highlights helping round out the follicular frame for her face. I felt a lump begin to gather in my throat, and my heart begin to pound a bit harder. My pulse began to rise, and I began to realize that, after all these years, here at what was the penultimate meeting between Judy Morriston and me, the end of our Rhodesville days and beginning to whatever our individual next stops might become, I was attracted to her. No. I was thinking I was head over heels for Judy. Her kindness and love toward me from the very beginnings of my tenure as her classmate flowed over me amid our conversation, and that, coupled with seeing her, truly seeing her, and just how beautiful she was for the first time had me roiling and lightheaded. Psst! I received an elbow in the ribs from Tasha to my left. It's time for our road to stand and walk. I was surprised to see that Judy and I had whiled away through the initial MAs, and that it was, actually, my time to rise and get moving from my turn to traverse this practice of our final high school walk. We talked through all of my best friend's turns across, though. Wow, is all I could think. See you in a tick. Go tear him up, Tony. Judy Whisper giggled out at me as I hurried to bring my chair around, stand, and get moving along with the rest of the MAs. My row shuffled toward the stage erected at what was serving as the front of the Coliseum floor. The vice principal read each of our names, 
and we climbed the steps and crossed the raised platform, only stopping to initial beside our name if the vice principal got it right. If he got it wrong, we were asked to spell it phonetically, to ensure he wouldn't be harassed or harangued by any disgruntled relatives after the ceremonies. Ronald Wayne Mackard. Ronald seemed genuinely surprised and pleased that his name had been pronounced correctly and sauntered up for his turn to initial and head back to his seat. Sweat Anias Hasdrubal Martin? I cringed. No one could ever pronounce my real name. There was a reason I went by Tony after all. As the Snickers filled the seated and standing soon-to-be graduates alike, I made my way to the vice principal utterly unsurprised and displeased, knowing that I'd be writing up some phonetics before he'd even opened his mouth. This was the burden of having two history teachers as parents. One was obsessed with Imperial Rome, and the other bled the Punic Wars. So there you have it. Sweetonius, Hasdrubal, Tony Martin, indeed. After I put down a simplified writing of my name for tomorrow's attempt at it and began making my way across the stage to return to my seat, I looked to my left at all my fellow Rhodesville near graduates. Judy was standing up with her row and beginning to make her way up, just as I had done. She grinned at me and gave me two thumbs up, sticking her tongue out and winking an eye at me. She probably cracked up when she heard the butchering of my name. Looking out at her, I damn near tripped down the stairs. Good lord. She really was getting to me. I barely heard a muffled, Tasha Jane Mason, from the vice principal as I descended and ambled my way to my seat. There again, directly to my right was Ronald McCard. Soon again, directly to my left, was Tasha Mason. We sat awkwardly and silent yet again. I felt myself straightening my back and craning my neck in order to get a better view of Judy, who, at least for the moment, stood silently surrounded by the M.O.s. She caught my craning, and her smile flashed again. I blushed furiously and sat back. The vice principal droned on and I zoned out. That is, until I heard, Judy and Morristown. Yet again, I shot up to watch her proudly stride across the stage, her robe flipping and flapping behind her. I positioned my seat back to the better angle for speaking with her, and I realized that, here at the end of our journey together, my most paramount desire, my chief focus was on urgently trying to soak in as much time with Judy as I could before we parted ways, before she would become some fading memory of my future disenchanted self far from this moment filled with so much electricity. And talk we did. Our rememberings went on as the MUs moved to the NAs, all the way until our Armenian and Chinese peers that took up the majority of the Zs. Somewhere around the Ss, though, we surprised ourselves. I especially gave myself a shock, because I asked Judy straight out, why didn't we ever date, Jude? Jude. As if because we'd become so close during this exchange that it already demanded a more intimate nickname from me. Upon hearing the question, she sat back a little bit and fluffed her robe to give herself a moment to think, biting her lip a little while doing so. I couldn't help but notice her deep dimples form and move about as she chewed away at whatever thoughts were crossing her mind. Honestly, Tom, I don't know. I've always had a crush on you, like a major crush. I was slack-jawed and almost unable to breathe. Oh, come on, Tony. It's not like you don't know you're attractive. You're a football player that can jam at guitar. You might be the only football jock that isn't an utter jerk. Plus, I just think you're fun to be around. And don't forget, we've been married since 8th grade anyway, huh? At that, I laughed aloud, 
warranting quite a fire and brimstone look from one of the poor schmuck teachers wrangled into trying to keep us all quiet during this extended practice. I lowered my voice back to whispering level and re-engaged. Judy, I said, honestly, I'm pretty sure I fell for you back then in 8th grade, but back then I was the new kid and super fat and clearly poorer than everyone else. Hell, I was terrified of everything and everyone. I didn't know how to go about asking a girl out. Right now, I'm a bit confused why I never spoke up before though. I mean, am I crazy? Or are we pretty much crazy for one another? She simpered at me, radiating the same unbounded joy and warmth that she first sent my way back in our little pretending to be adults class together. The same limitless kindness that made me feel like a person when I was new and scared and felt very much alone in that place. She reached and touched my left hand, turning it over, and then lacing her right hand's fingers in with mine. Leaning forward, she breathed. I don't know. It's just a real shame that now is when we get to this, huh? But maybe... But maybe we have... Time? Her eyes glistening, getting glossier with what looked to be near tears. There, amid the hubbub of all those moving bodies and hushed conversations, many probably not unlike our own, pregnant with admissions and realizations and rushed confessions. I loved her with everything that was me. And, in her seafoam green eyes that gathered all the light in the room and shot it back at whoever was in her gaze tenfold, I saw that she loved me with everything that she was too. In that moment, it took everything in me not to lean forward and kiss Judy Morriston. Something four years in the making, something four long years overdue. This was the most powerful connection that my 17-year-old self had ever encountered. It was intoxicating. It was confusing. It was an electric push into a thousand might have beens and a thousand more still could bees. It is always difficult seeing the magnitude of a moment in that moment. For example, birthdays sometimes seem life-affirming or soul-crushing to the birthday boy or girl, no matter what their age, when, in reality, they are often just another day with a bit of guilt around it in the form of a cake or a little extra attention from friends or family. Whereas, the decision to go to Chinese over Italian might not feel like a shift in the universe, yet this is the type of mundane decision that can, will, and does cause one to garner a smile in that restaurant. The smile back might not seem like a magnitude in this moment, but that smile then opens the door for them to meet their new fling who becomes their reluctant partner who becomes their devoted spouse, who becomes their bitter divorce. All over a trade of lasagna for lo mein. So, long after I had donned my amorphous crimson robe and stored it away at my mom's house, refusing to give it away as if holding on to it would freeze time, or as if it held some sort of magic in it, or for whatever reason it is we humans do such things, Long after the vice principal got my name right as I marched across the stage to the low buzz of the Rhodesville chamber band. Long after we'd thrown hats in the air, embracing cliché, and then departed with our families to celebrate our accomplishments. I revisited that ritual I had always thought inane and did, indeed, find it to be an event that was less life-changing cataclysm than underwhelming anticlimacticism. Though it did not lack all meaning. I saw my friends walk with well-earned satisfaction and confidence across that stage. 
I saw the pride in my family's eyes before and after the ceremony. I saw classmates that never thought they'd make it through high school to earn that sought-after diploma grasping it, like their lives depended on keeping it firmly in hand. I saw Judy Ann Morriston for who she was for the very first time, and I loved the woman I'd just met. The woman I'd already known for roughly 1,460 days. That last bit is what gives me pause. No matter how many times I've revisited this memory over the past decade. I didn't kiss her that day of the rehearsal. At our graduation, things were far too boisterous and frenzied to find a time to sneak away and have our moment. Plus, it just didn't have the spark that was there the day before. Not because of any lack of desire from either Judy or me, but because of the aforementioned chaos. After graduation, Judy and I saw each other from time to time, both around town and at our college, but only in passing. In fact, we interned for the same company in California one summer, but we worked in different parts of the massive complex and for different people and departments that kept utterly different hours. But still, I honestly cannot find the reason why neither of us ever reached out during that year together on the West Coast, or the 5,000 times we saw one another in passing at our tiny little hometown university, the only one that we could afford. I mean, we never even sat down for a coffee together in those four more years allotted us by time and fate. In the matter of two or three hours during a graduation rehearsal of all things, we'd come to realize that we cared about one another deeply. Far more deeply for one another than any of our past or future now turned present significant others. Yet, after that, we never capitalized on that realization. People go their entire lives longing for such an interaction, such a sinking up of souls with another human being, and we tossed it away with, ostensibly, little concern. Though, now at least, I can say that I've done so with a heap of remorse. And today, here, in the present, these days, Judy is married with one son and one daughter on the way, here in just about six months. She married a jet setter of a man she met during our internship though they didn't strike up their relationship until a couple years after Judy had returned home and finished university. His family is originally from India, and they have boo-coodles of money, the kind of money that neither Judy nor I had ever encountered in our small town, the kind of money we first realized was even a possibility out in California. They travel all over the world on his engineer's salary, and they stay in the various vacation homes his family owns. The far-flung places they go are nothing but fantasy to her old friends from her old life. Casablanca, Riyadh, Male, Marrakesh, Muscat, Manila, Abu Dhabi. She teaches English to 7th graders, loving Shakespeare above all else. Another fact that breaks my heart, just a little in my knowing it as it only underscores how compatible we two still are. The bard swears that love that comes too late, like a remorseful pardon slowly carried, turns a sour offense. But I can't say the old poet's right about that one, at least where Judy and I are concerned. With her, there is no sour, only bittersweet. We've texted once or twice a year or so back, just saying hi and seeing if the other was alive. We've tried to plan a day for me to come and have dinner with her family, an opportunity for me to meet her husband and at least open the door for a friendship. Those days always fall through. We also saw one another at the recent 10-year reunion. She was without her husband and we shared some words and a drink at the bar of the country club where our little shindig was held. That conversation was clipped short by one of her old high school friends, though. Kristen was her name, maybe? We were just opening the old bottle of 
Remember that conversation at graduation rehearsal? When the shutdown came, I'm betting Judy arranged a get-me-out-of-trouble-before-I-give-in-to-it type thing with her. Not that I would ever cross that particular line. But, at any rate, we've never repeated that conversation, never dealt with our mutual, graduated realization that we left fallow and untended. This progressive, tapered, epiphanic awakening to our mutual adoration and, at least initially, rapturous ardor has not dissipated, even after all this time separating us from that fateful afternoon. I think that's why she and I can never see one another again, why the stars align such that we will never be able to revisit that moment. So epic. So dramatic. My mind becomes feverish, even all these years later, when reaching back to that past memory. So feverish that I lose myself in the verses that I know she reads with such relish. When you depart from me, sorrow abides, and happiness takes his leave. Perdition catch my soul! But I do love thee, and when I love thee not, chaos is come again. Sweet, above thought I love thee. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends when the remover to remove. Oh no! It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Time and again I repeat those verses. Time and again I rehash those thousand might-have-beens and thousand more still-could-bees, though the latter are far more unlikely than they were that day in May, a lifetime ago. It is always difficult seeing the magnitude of a moment in that moment. Thank you for listening to Graduated Realization, an original short story by me, Jared I. McGee. The tracks behind this song are numerous, so please check out prosepodcast.com for links. Simply click on the mentioned track titles, album titles, or artists' names to go to their various pages. All of these tracks are being used under various Creative Commons licenses. That being said, the music included behind this story was taken from the Free Music Archive and includes... Like Starlight Through a Veil from the album Soundtracks by Philip Weigel. I Need to Start Writing Things Down from the album The Dark Glow of the Moon by Chris Zabriskie. Old Regrets from the album Music for Podcasts 3 by Lee Rosevere. You Were My Robot Lover from the album The February Album by Quiet Music for Tiny Robots. 2020 Vision from the album Ad Astra Volume 2 by PC3. And finally... A Thousand Skins Part 2, No Vocals, from the album Ashes by Josh Woodward. All of the Creative Commons licenses being used are Attribution 4.0 International licenses, save for Mr. Woodward's track, which is being used under an Attribution 3.0 Unported license. Thank you to these artists and the Free Music Archive for making their work available to enhance projects such as this one. That will do it this week for Pros. Please stay tuned for a special midweek surprise to celebrate Prose's six-month anniversary. See you all on Wednesday.